Well, today, KT, we're going to roll up our sleeves and begin to plow into some direction for a church. Some of you might have seen this diagram, it's a little blurry on the screen, but we want to be rooted. We started the year by saying you're a blessed people. You're absolutely blessed. God has put his favor upon you. But we want to understand that we have to be rooted in Christ, rooted in his love, rooted in his church. And actually, we're going to develop a pathway that everybody can access, rooted and then growing in we're growing in wholeness, growing in your gifts, growing in how, how you understand the scripture. So rooted, growing. And for the next month, I'm going to be talking about being fruitful. And actually, we're moving from inspiration to instruction. So you might want to take notes. You might want to catch up and do some things in your group meetings. But we want to explore what it really means to be fruitful. God has planted and destined your life for fruitfulness. I'm going to be using the passage that Scott so ably read, Pastor Scott ably read earlier, John chapter 15. Now, when we look through the scriptures, a survey of the Bible will tell you that God intends us to be fruitful, not just to do routines so that we can get to heaven, or to be involved in structures to keep us good. God's desire for you is fruitfulness. Remember Jesus walking along with the disciples one day. He wants figs. He doesn't get figs. He curses the tree. I'm sure the disciples thought to themselves, that's a little bit of an overreaction. But fruitfulness is God's burning desire for you. Now, I need to be able to convince you of this, so we're going to do a little walk through Scripture in a moment, but this is what I mean and what the Scripture means by fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is that we become more than what we could become on our own. With all our personality, with all our gifts, with our talents, it, it, when you put all that together, it makes you and you produce something. And God says, you know all of that? I want even more. And I'm going to enable you that you become even more than what you could possibly be on your own. That we have fruitfulness is that we have this productivity and an effect that is greater than us, than, than what we could possibly do on our own. Fruitfulness is when God takes you and says, I'm going to multiply your life out. God wants fruit. Now, I actually could even put it stronger. God demands fruit. He, when he sees a barren place, he says, I want to bless it. I want to make it fruitful. I want it to grow. Let me take you through the whole scripture. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 was where we got the scripture from that you're a blessed people. But the very first command is, be fruitful and multiply. When the world crashed and fell apart and was, was covered with a flood, the very first thing that God said to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verse 7, when he came out of the ark is, fill the earth, increase, be fruitful and multiply. When Abraham, as the great patriarch, looked up at the skies and the Lord said to him, can you count stars, Abraham? I'm going to make you as, as numerous as the stars in the sky. I'm going to make you fruitful and you will multiply. You know, when we think about Jesus coming, in the book of Isaiah, it says in, in chapter 11 that uh, Jesus would be, a shoot would come from the stump of Jesse and his roots, a branch will bear a fruit. They will bear fruit. The whole ministry of Jesus and the reason why Jesus came was so that he and his life, his sacrifice, his teachings could produce fruit. You are that fruit. Everything is done is so they can produce the fruit of you. God wants fruit. 
Jeremiah was shown a, Jeremiah, a, a vision of two baskets of figs, one, one good figs, one bad figs in Jeremiah 24. And uh, God is saying, I want the good figs. I want that fruit. John chapter 15, as Scott read, uh, verse 16 says, you did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you. Now, this word appointed in the Greek means this that God takes you by, almost by the shoulders and puts you in another place and says, there I want you, and I want you there to produce fruit. Jesus said, I've appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Your destiny is fruitfulness. Actually, once you see this theme of fruitfulness in the scripture, in fact, let me, let me kind of predict something. I'm not prophesying something. Let me predict something. When you read your Bible this week, the, the theme of fruitfulness will, will be there. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. In fact, this week, uh, if you want to write down an email, smo at uh, kt.org, when you see the theme of fruitfulness, drop me a little email and say, I've seen it, I've seen it. That was me, by the way, miming you texting off your phone. God wants fruit. Once you see it, you can't unsee it, but actually it will change your life. In fact, can I say that your destiny is fruitfulness? That actually, when we talk a lot about the scriptures and uh, the Bible and discipleship, actually, the real core of discipleship, and I'll, I'll get to structures for that, but actually, really what I want to do over this next month is we want to get into some instruction that causes a culture, culture before structure. Can I tell you that even in eternity, your destiny is fruitfulness? Now, I know that some of you think, oh man, uh, please don't, uh, don't hear, oh, Pastor Mark, you're gonna ask me to do this, do this, do more. Take that pressure off. I'm gonna switch this talk in a minute for something really helpful. But in, in eternity, as we go into eternity, can I say to you that your destiny will be fruitfulness and this theme of fruitfulness follows us into heaven, if I can put it like that. Revelation chapter 22, verse two, simply says this. Down the middle of the great city, uh, the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood a tree of life bearing crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month and the leaves of the trees for the healing of the nation. God wants fruit and it's your eternal destiny to be fruitful. Doesn't matter how you feel right now. Doesn't matter how things have fallen apart, although we care about the things of poor of, uh, might have fallen apart. But can you just receive the truth? God wants you to be fruitful. Don't, don't put anything else on it yet. Just receive that truth. This is the first part of instruction. There is no doubt that you being fruitful is on God's heart, that it's on his mind, that it's becoming his and is his intention for you. So the question comes, what, what's the fruit, Lord? What, what do you mean by fruitfulness? What is this fruit that God wants for us? Turn to Philippians chapter one, verse 11. And there's different translations, it's, but it says this, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. Some translations have it as the fruit of righteousness. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, Philippians 1.11, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and much praise to God. The first thing that fruit is, is the fruit of connection to God and everything that salvation means. That when he puts salvation in your life, he's gonna unpack everything that that means in your life. 
the, the reconciliation of forgiveness and peace of mind, that you're gonna get the fruit of what Jesus did on the cross. That, that you've been connected to God as a spiritual person and everything that salvation means, you're gonna get the, pro, the, the produce from that, the fruit of that. Another thing that fruit means is the fruit of of souls or people or, or winning people to Jesus or actually your influence on them through your ministry. The, the, the way that you serve people will produce fruit in your life and in their lives. Galatians chapter six, verse nine says, let us not become weary in doing good because at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Now, how many of you know that people are the most frustrating thing in the world? You know, you're a Christian, and you go into work, you've had a great Sunday, God's spoken to you, and you go into work, you know. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Jesus loves you. And all you get back is, har, 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 har. God's going to give you fruit with every person. People can be so difficult, but God's going to give you the fruit of people. You've served some people for a long time. That fruit's coming. You've invested in that teenager for a long time, and all that they've said is no, 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 no. Eventually, the yes is coming. I don't want to say anything bad about teenagers because we love them. The fruit of your salvation will come. The fruit of people will come. And then God's gonna give you the fruit of your character and personal change. That actually, that as you change, you're gonna be able to see that you're not stuck in this life. I have a word for somebody today, and this is actually a word for this service. I just feel there's, there's several people here today, and I'd love to pray for you at the end of the service, that you felt like stuck for a while. I, I believe God's going to give you the, the fruit of change, the fruit of your character changing. That's what Philippians 1, 11 means. That actually God's going to start working, and things that you haven't been able to change for a while, God's going to help you with that. But also, and this is the obvious one, and some people have been, uh, even in your minds as you've been listening, thinking, when, when are you gonna say this? God is gonna give us the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter five, verse 22. Hey, can you say it with me? Can you name them off? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Woo, wouldn't it be great? Now, some of you are thinking, oh, I missed one out, I missed one out. Wouldn't it be great if we had those? What type of person would you be if you were that? You know, you were a loving person, a joyful person, a peaceful person, a person of patience or forbearing with people, a kind person, a, a person of goodness, faithfulness, that you just, and you had gentleness, and you could have self-control, and you could say, chocolate, be gone. You know, what a lovely fruit. You see, when I first started this message, when I'm saying God wants fruit, for some of you, you'd automatically put yourself under pressure. You'd automatically be, be saying to yourself, you, you, you know what, I, I don't know whether I can get any fruit. And actually, we're gonna flip this and take the pressure off you, but can you just convince yourself that this fruit is worth it because you're gonna become a beautiful person. As well as, as well as the fruit of people, as well as the fruit of salvation, as well as the fruit of the spirit, as well as the fruit of your character and change, God wants to give you the fruit of a ministry. He wants to give you the fruit of a kingdom purpose and, and how you contribute into the kingdom. When Jesus called the 72 or the 70 together, he told them the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Let's pray, therefore, that the Lord sends workers into the harvest. God has a ministry for you. He's got a kingdom purpose for you. And actually, come on, I, today I'm gonna talk about instruction. We, well, hopefully it'll be inspiring but today's about instructing. And 
God, if you want to think, well, what's the culmination of discipleship? Well, God, what is the point of all of this? It's your fruitful kingdom purpose. Now, you may not know that yet, but if you can hang that and say, you know what, God's got something huge for me. It may not make you famous, but it will be significant. Let me summarize it. It'll be on the screen uh, for you. Fruit is this connection to God, this kind of relationship with him that pours things into your life. Fruit is connection to character, that, that you, you are changing. Fruit is a connection to people. God's got people that he wants to give you and you to influence them as you serve them. And fruit is a connection to your kingdom purpose. Now don't worry about, when pastors talk about purpose, sometimes it freaks people out. We'll get to that. But fruit is your kingdom purpose. Every single person, there's no unemployment in the kingdom of God. He's got absolute purpose for you. Fruitfulness is the process whereby you become more productive from God, more than you could do on your own. So church, take a load off now. Stop striving. God wants to produce fruit in you that you could do much more than what you could ever do by striving on your own. Because here's the teaching. It is clear from Jesus' words that fruit comes out of close connection with him, or shall we say this word, abiding in Christ. Everybody turn to John chapter 15. Let's look at the words of Jesus. John chapter 15, verses four and five say this, remain in me. Uh, some of you might have the translation abide. I like the word abide, don't you? It's like almost you can feel yourself sitting down when you say it. Remain, abide in me, Jesus says. And I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide or remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now here's the thing. God wants fruit. You can't do it on your own. Let's sink in a minute. God demands fruit, you can't do it without him. So stop striving. Jesus said it this way, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now it doesn't mean to say we, do, we don't do anything, but if you don't, understand that this connection with Jesus for you to produce fruit is absolutely vital. It won't happen for you. What does it mean to remain or to abide? Remember the goal is fruitfulness. Let's take it to, if you're gonna be fruitful, you've got to abide. The Greek word for abide is meno, and it means, uh, it's a kind of package of things. First of all, to abide means that you have to have this conscious checking with Jesus, consistently communicating with him. How many of you have ever read the scripture where it says pray without ceasing? How many of you have been walking down the street going, oh Jesus, I just need you to hear this. Uh, how many of you have ever prayed on a bus? You know, just under your breath. It, abiding means this conscious checking with Jesus, consistently communicating with him. See now, what I'm gonna do is break down the package of abiding, what, what the Greek word means, because lots of people, uh, pastors have often preached on abiding, and, they, and you, uh, some of you be sitting there saying, oh, I don't know how, what I do, just sit quietly, and listen to dreamy music, what to do. No, the first thing you do is you consciously check in with Jesus, consistently communicating with him. Secondly, you stay under his influence, you live there, under his influence. Now, we all have influences on us and uh, what you have to kind of begin to say and begin to decide is what's the greatest influence in my life? 
There are people influencing. There are, there are directions in your life influencing you. But if you're going to abide, you have to say, Jesus, what's the influence right now on my life? Can I give this influence to you? Can you be the greatest influence in my life? Who, who is influencing you? Who's the greatest influence? Now, Christians, you assume it's Jesus, but don't assume it. Actually call it out and say, what is influencing me now? Thirdly, it's this active awareness that Jesus is there. That's how you abide. Remember in some Caribbean homes, they used to have this, this uh, plaque on the, on the wall that says, Jesus, the silent visitor, the unseen guest at every meal. You know, I don't want Jesus to be unseen. I don't want him to be uh, the silent visitor. I want to actively say, Jesus, you are here right now. In fact, he's here now. He's here now. We've got to begin to say, Lord, where are you in this situation? I want just to pause and understand your presence. Remember that story in the Old Testament where the servant looks out at the opposing army, he's next to Elisha, and, and he kind of says, oh man, there's lots of them. And Elisha says, open his eyes because there's more for us than there are against us. You know, I just wonder sometimes whether God could ever open our eyes and, and see the angels in our building. You know, I, there's a little nine-year-old girl in Birmingham. Her name was Grace. She, she actually died tragically in a fire. Three weeks before she died or four weeks before she died, she, she came to me. I was, you know, I was kind of standing at the front like I do here. And she came to me and she tugged my trousers. She passed them off, passed them off, passed them off. And I'm thinking, I am the pastor. Thou hast tugged the holy trousers. You know, but it was like a, a real tug, you know, it was kind of inappropriate. And she said, Pastor Mark, look up, look up. And I went, well, I just see the roof. And she's saying, don't you see all those angels? You see, she could see something I didn't see. We've got to become actively aware that Jesus is here. And, and together when we're in church, this is a holy place. Because we're his holy people. And in, if you're going to abide, you've got to consciously begin to say, Jesus, I understand you are here. Help me become more aware of your presence. Abiding means constantly checking in with Jesus consistently. Abiding means staying under his influence so that he is the greatest influence in everything you do. Abiding means being actively aware that he is there. Abiding means that we ask and receive for him strength. Now, when we say that phrase, we all say, I want to receive strength for God. But you know what it really means? Strength from God means that God changes your attitude and your perspective so you can see things the way that he sees things. That actually, the, that from within you, the Holy Spirit begins to change your perspective perspective and give you attitude and that's able to go through almost anything have you I've heard some fantastic uh, healing stories uh, you know we've prayed for people uh, and they've been healed of cancer and I love those stories but I've also in my ministry had people where it's absolutely incredible how people are really suffering with cancer and yet they have this unusual strength and grace and it's almost they don't know where they're getting it from have you come across that too that God gives them strength to go through some things look at this unusual scripture in Romans chapter 11 verse 17 if some of the branches that have been broken off uh, and you though you were a wild olive street uh, olive shoot you've been grafted in among others now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root branch in other words well, what Paul is teaching to the Gentiles there is you have the Holy Spirit that nourishes you from within and gives you new perspective, new attitude. And the way to abide is to say, God, can I see it the way you see it? Now, lots of us as Pentecostals, we pray to be zapped by the Holy Spirit. I'm praying you're going to be sapped by the Holy Spirit. And that his strength comes from within, changes your uh, perspective 
and a new attitude that's going on. You see, this, the way, the goal is fruitfulness. The process is you must abide, you must remain, you must put yourself under that influence. And when this process of abiding then sets off a chain of events where you become more and more fruitful and more productivity comes from your life. As we consciously stay under the influence of Jesus, our hearts and our desires become changed so that when we pray, we are praying God's will. You know, Jesus, one of the most discussed verses is uh, John chapter 15, verse 7. And it says this, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, I ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. Could you imagine having a prayer life like that? Do you say, God, I want this. And God says, fine. You see, by this close connection, God shapes your heart, shapes you what you're like, so that actually you begin to pray things that are on God's heart. Wouldn't that be great to have that prayer life, that asking whatever you will, God says, fine. Have it it's on my heart too. See, as you abide, you begin to pray the things that God wants you to have. It's really just a rewriting of Psalm 37 verse 4 that says, take delight of the Lord and I will give you the desires of your heart. As you slow down a little bit and as you consciously connect with him, this abiding presence then begins to shape your prayer life. And as you abide, what happens is you get a deeper revelation of God's love. John 15 verse nine says, as the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. But now remain in my love. But this is further deepened when we actively pursue God's commands. It, you see, you want fruitfulness and the way to get it is by abiding in him. And as you abide in him, he changes your heart so that your prayer life changes and then it begins to change your heart so you begin to receive more love and it, and it kind of focuses your mind on God's commands. And God's commands act like a funnel so that God's love can be poured into your life. So when I say to you, now stay with me about fruitfulness. When I say to you about fruitfulness, I'm not asking you to become a striving, hardworking, religious, churchianity person. I'm saying that if you go for fruitfulness as your goal, and as you abide, love is gonna be poured out in your life. The love is gonna be coming into your heart. You're gonna be being transformed. You're gonna be changed. Things are gonna start popping up in your life that are beautiful. So can you go for fruitfulness? Come on, are you with me? Come on, somebody, somebody say amen. amen. Come on, we gotta go for fruitfulness because it's gonna change you. You see, the commands of God, they're like a conduit, like a funnel where the love of God begins to be poured into your life. And, and the chief command that God gives us, as Jesus said, when you start obeying God, God's gonna start nudging you over and point out some people that you have to love and he'll give you the strength to love them. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 15. Look at, follow along with me in verse nine. It says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Why are you looking for love in other places? Remain in his love. He's got all the significance, he's got all the forgiveness, he's got everything. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be complete and that your joy may be complete in your life. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. You see, by instead of just thinking about structure, if we go for the culture of, well, what the great goal of disciple is fruitfulness, you're not gonna become a horrible person. You're gonna become somebody who's full of joy, who's full of love, who knows how to love people, who God hears their heart. Fruitfulness is the goal, people. And God wants to use you in every and any situation because he's got fruit for you. 
I feel like since coming to London, I've put a little bit of weight on. No comments, please. Some of you might be saying, well, yeah, you know what, Pastor, now you say it. So I thought, I'm going to go buy myself an exercise bike. So I went down on Ealing Broadway to get on the train to go and find it. I just had a little, I'm scoping it. I've not done it yet. I'm building myself up to this great moment. I was on Ealing Broadway railway station, standing at the platform. I walked down the platform and I, my, I got my earphones in, but I wasn't, I'd just listened to a song and I, I wasn't, uh, it wasn't playing. And I walked past these two uh, young ladies. I think they were about, uh, well, I know now that they were between the ages of 16 and 18. And um, as I walked down the platform, they had head coverings on. I don't know whether they were, you know, that was for fashion or whether that was religious or not. And, uh, and as I walked past them, uh, they were singing. And, you know, that's an unusual thing, isn't it? They had a little song, and, and actually it was quite nice. And I turned and smiled and said, oh, that was nice. And they laughed and they said, yeah, we, we're singing. And so I thought that was it. And then they said to me, hey, mister, who's your favorite singer? <laughs> and I, and it, I said, well, I, I, you know, I've listened to lots of music. And then they said, um, I bet you like Adele. And I'm thinking... Do I look like an Adele fan? Or <laughs> and actually, at that moment, I was listening to a different song by an artist called uh, Lily uh, Miola. Uh, listen to this. This is one of a little snippet of her song. Go to college for your plan B. What you want is too risky. Live for weekends and whiskey. We all got these big ideas. One day there will be. Placed with fear. How did we get here? Darling, don't quit your daydream. It's your life that you're making. So I get my phone out and I said, well, well, actually, I'm listening to this. And I play them the verse just this song. Let me read you the lyrics. It said, when we were kids in the backyard, playing astronaut, we played our astronauts and rock stars. No one told us to stop it. No one called us unrealistic. Then suddenly you're 18 and you go to college for your plan B. What you want is too risky. You live for weekends and whiskey. We've all got these big ideas. And one day to be replaced with fears. How did we get here? Darling, don't quit your daydream. It's your life that you're making. If it ain't big enough and doesn't scare the hell out of you, it make, if it makes you nervous, then it's probably worth it. Why save it for sleep when you could be living your daydream? So I'm on the platform and I play them just to that sign. One of the girls starts crying. I said, oh, this, this is what I'm listening to. I mean, it's a weird conversation, right? You know, and uh, she starts crying and she says, that's my life. That's my life. That's my life. I, I, I've already, I'm already on plan B. I'm not really living my life. So then I say, hey, my name is Mark. I'm a Christian minister and God has got a massive purpose for you. He's got love for you. He's got a purpose for your life. And then she says, oh, oh man. And she's crying. I'm thinking, this is a bit, you know. You know, like evangelists have these stories, you know, and they love it. And I'm going, oh, I'm just a pastor. So, so then I say, well, hey, I'm, I'm the pastor of a church in Notting Hill. It's called Kensington Temple. The other girl says, my friend goes there. She's told me to go there. We should go there. <laughs> so... So I invite her for today, and, and girls, if you're here, sorry to talk about you in public. But you know what? It stopped me, and I started thinking about you. God's got fruit for you. And we know that as we get a bit older, you, you know, you've had plan A, B, I'm on plan Y. <laughs> That's life. 
you know, and, and you know, young people, they're so anxious. You know, I've got to have my dream. And you think, no, it's going to be all right. It's going to be fine. But what I, what I want to say to you is some of you are living with a little bit of regret and it hasn't worked out for you and your ministry is not what you think it should be. But that doesn't change the fact God wants you to be fruitful. And right at this moment in your life, you can be fruitful. And, and you know, Kathy and I, we're going to be fruitful. I, I just want to assure you, darling, when I say fruitful, I'm not talking about having more kids, okay? <laughs> you know, but it's time now. So, some of you have given up. You, you've said to yourselves, I didn't get plan A, I didn't get plan B. God's given up on me. He's not given up on you. God's desire for you. Jesus' teaching is, I appointed you. I picked you up from that place. This is what the word appointed means. I picked you up from that place. I placed you in this place because I want you to be fruitful. And not just a little bit of fruit. You know, a little bit of cherry. You know, you can have mangoes. You know, you can have something bigger. Did I say the wrong thing? His mango's a bad word anyway, you know. I thought you'd be more impressed with that. Okay, God wants pineapples, not just a little cherry thing. Cherries are fine, but you're gonna have huge fruit. Oh, Jesus, help us. Because what I'm gonna do over the next month, I'm gonna try and instruct you in this process of fruit and fruitfulness. Abiding is not one thing. It's a package. Lots of pastors, and I'm going to get the worship team to come, you know. Lots of pastors will teach about abiding, and they leave the congregation thinking, wow, we're just supposed to sit in silence or something. And actually, abiding is a package. It's several things, not one thing. It's this active consciousness of him. This, this calling to our awareness that he's here. It's this evaluation of, of who's, the, who's influencing me. What are the voices that are speaking to my mind? It's, it's laying some of those aside and saying, God, I want to hear your word. It's stepping into his commands. Sensing his love. You see, all of this leads to this intimacy where we connect with him it, And it provokes us keenly to begin to say, you know what, there are some things I just need to do. So I want to encourage you today that when we go for fruitfulness, it's not that you're going to become this hardworking church person that where everything's an effort. Actually, you're going to begin to hear his love and have a deeper revelation of his love and his joy is going to fill you and your kingdom purpose will open out in slices as you step into it one by one let's go for fruitfulness